Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you all for for coming uh, to this event. Um, it's good to get out of Washington and speak to uh, audiences in, in different places, people who aren't necessarily as jaded as we are uh, down in Washington. <laughs> it's been a really big year for trade and as a trade policy wonk. I, you know, I've been at Cato doing trade policy for 16 years. Uh, it's exciting that trade has been so topical, uh, but it's also very depressing that it's been topical really for the wrong reasons. It's been topical in a way, sort of like the way Anthony Weiner was topical. Uh, it's very <laughs> negative. Trade was dragged through the mud. Uh, there was a lot of maligning, a lot of misinformation, a lot of mythology. Uh, we see a lot of that in presidential election years, um, so going, going back to the NAFTA debate in 1992. But it was particularly acute, this go around. Uh, it came from both ends of the spectrum. We had uh, Trump's economic nationalism coming from the right, where trade is a zero-sum game. Uh, exports are our points, imports are the foreign team's points, the trade account is the scoreboard. We have a deficit, so we're losing. And we're losing a trade, of course, because the foreign team is cheating. That, that's the narrative. On the other side, coming from Bernie Sanders, we have this sort of anti-capitalist, anti-corporate uh, view of trade, where trade and trade agreements only benefit wealthy people uh, and big corporations, uh, when in fact the opposite is true. Uh, most trade barriers are regressive taxes, the biggest beneficiaries from trade liberalization are lower income uh, Americans in, 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 when you're speaking about the United States. Smaller businesses, they, uh, trade barriers are a much larger burden to them than they are to, to big companies. Big companies can absorb these costs. So uh, there's a lot of mythology out there um, and we need to push back on that. But President Trump, uh, you know, true to his word, uh, withdrew the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership on the third day, his third day in office. Um, he has uh, promised to reopen the, the North American Free Trade Agreement, renegotiate it. The people uh, that he, whom he has uh, um, appointed, Peter Navarro uh, to this new National Trade Council position in the White House, Wilbur Ross at the Commerce Department, uh, Secretary of Commerce, uh, uh, Robert Lighthizer as USTR, uh, see trade. Uh, they, they, they have this interest in pursuing bilateral agreements as opposed to regional agreements. They, there's this view that uh, U.S. leverage can be brought to bear when it, on, in a one-on-one -on -one negotiation. I think it, it betrays a lack of understanding of how trade negotiations actually work. Uh, there's this presumption that in the TPP, for example, you have 11 countries ganging up on the United States, when in fact that's really not how it works. Uh, uh, alliances are sort of... Uh, um, fleeting, or they shift from, from issue to issue. Anyway, economically, it makes very little sense to, in my opinion, to have s smaller trade agreements as opposed to a bigger one. You want the same rules applying to a broader set of producers and consumers so you can achieve greater specialization, economies of scale, et cetera. Um, but Trump has also talked about using protectionism, using tariffs. He's threatened tariffs against China for currency manipulation, which is a 10, 12-year-old story. It's not happening anymore. Uh, he's threatened uh, to impose duties on imports from Mexico, particularly on U.S. companies that are outsourcing there. Um, they started to go after Germany. It seems like countries with whom the United States runs a trade deficit are targets, and the view is you have a trade surplus with us, so this is, we're going to use this as our leverage. Uh, we're going to bring you back to the table, and we're going to negotiate bilaterals, and we're going to open them up every year or two if we don't hit our targets. So. What we're hearing, to me, I interpret it as pure managed trade. Um, it's not the kind of trade agreement that's going to facilitate cross-border investment and, and, re and investment in, in business relationships. Um, so his rhetoric, his actions, his, his worldview uh, really represent a major departure uh, from 80 years of U.S. trade policy, uh, from presidential administrations from both major parties, uh, from F going all the way back to FDR, have always seen trade uh, as, as positive, uh, as important to international relations, um, as, as a salve or as something that can help prevent conflagration between countries. This administration sees uh, protectionism as a tool. It's a complete 180 degree turn so far. That's what we're hearing so far. Um, so it's, it's not entirely clear what, what is going to happen with the Trump administration. Um, there has been some uh, 
withdrawal from the rhetoric to some extent, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure yet. So it's not clear where policy is going to be taken. Um, his major, his USTR and Commerce Secretary are not in place yet. Um, but the uncertainty that, it, this is, that the, the rhetoric and the early actions have created uh, is rippling around the world. And it's rippling, certainly it's affecting uh, trade in the Pacific and the way governments and countries in the Pacific are, are viewing uh, the relationship with the United States and the future of the region. So there are a lot of questions uh, to, to answer. And fortunately for you and for me, uh, we have with us today uh, three panelists who are among the world's best, greatest experts uh, on Asia-Pacific uh, trade issues. Um, I think without betraying anybody's particular age among them. They have about 100 years of, uh, of service to their countries and to their, to their careers, uh, understanding the nature of our, our trade relationships. So um, let me um, let you know we're going to tap into their wisdom. I'm going to introduce them now, then I'm going to sit down, and we're going to have a conversation. And then with about 20 minutes left, we'll try to open it up for, uh, for conversation. So uh, well, in, in, in the middle is, is, is Wendy Cutler. Uh, she's Vice President and Managing Director at the Asia Society Policy Institute, which is a think tank, do tank uh, in Washington. Where there she leads initiatives on women's uh, empowerment, women empowerment in Asia and trade issues. Uh, she joined ASPI uh, following an illustrious career uh, in, in for nearly three decades as a, as a diplomat and a negotiator at the uh, U.S. Trade Representative's Office. Most recently, she was acting Deputy U.S. Trade Rep. Uh, and she worked on a range of U.S. Uh, trade negotiations and initiatives in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, in that capacity, um, she was in charge of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, she was the chief U.S. negotiator for the CHORUS, the, US, the Korea-U.S. Uh, Free Trade Agreement. Uh, Wendy's other responsibilities with USTR included U.S.-China uh, relations, the Asia-Pacific Economic uh, Cooperation Forum, uh, and U.S.-India uh, Public Forum. There, there's a handout that has their bios. So I won't go. I won't go into all of it, but there, there's 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 plenty more to read uh, if you want to know more about our panelists. Uh, Yi Wan Kim is the Council General at the Consulate General uh, of the Republic of Korea here in New York. Uh, prior to having that post, which he's been in for about two, uh, two years, uh, he served as Minister of, uh, for Economic Affairs in the Korean Embassy in Washington. Uh, for about a four-year period. Uh, I met, met you uh, at a dinner we had at, at Cato for uh, Han Duk Su, and uh, yeah. we had a good conversation that night. Mm -hmm. uh, other previous appointments include Director General for Multilateral Trade in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and, and Trade, where he handled WTO, APEC, OECD, and G20 trade matters. Um, Again, there's, there's a lot more to read uh, about Ambassador Kim in the, in the packet, but in the interest of time, I'll introduce uh, Ambassador Oshima, uh, uh, Shotaro Oshima. He's uh, chairman of the Institute for International Economic Studies, and he's also a visiting professor of the politics of world trade uh, at the National Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Tokyo. Uh, Ambassador Oshima's 40 year uh, experience as a diplomat in Japan's foreign service includes serving as a member of the WTO appellate body from four years, 2008 to 2012. Uh, he was an mm -hmm. ambassador to the Republic of Korea from 2005 to 2007. He was ambassador to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, for two years, 2000 and 2001, uh, and Director General for Economic Affairs uh, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, again, consult the packet. Uh, you'll learn more about the panelists, but we're, I'm going to sit down and we're going to have a conversation about these, uh, these, these issues. And uh, starting right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So, can you hear me? Am I mic'd up? Good. So let's get down to it right, right away. I mean, President Trump withdrew us from the TPP after six years of negotiations. Um, what does it mean? Uh, are we? Uh, do, what, what, what do we think uh, lies ahead? for the TPP. Uh, I understand there's a meeting coming up in Chile. Chile is taking the initiative to try to get countries to, the remaining 11 countries to think about how to proceed forward. Is this something that can happen without the United States? Is it meaningful enough? Is there enough um, intent to go forward? Um, I don't want to 
Why don't I start with you, Wendy? Okay. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here, and, um, and my fellow panelists. Um, as Dan mentioned, there are 100 years between the three of us. Um, both of them, their years are a lot longer than mine. <laughs> no, ages, <laughs> not the years in own trade. <laughs> and in any event, um, the, the recent withdrawal of the United States from TPP has really um, caused a lot of concern, scratching heads, and kind of regrouping um, in the rest of Asia. Frankly, I think a lot of our Asian trading partners don't really understand why we withdrew. Um, they watched our presidential campaign, um, and they understand there are a lot of anxieties associated with globalization and trade in the United States. But with respect to TPP, I think they view it as an agreement where the US really achieved a lot of its priorities in the negotiations. And the fact that it's walked away and kind of thrown that all away is kind of hard for them to process. That said, they are trying to work through this now and figure out basically how do they respond. And I think there are a number of different responses um, that different countries are working through right now. Um, first, um, the first kind of um, alternative would be just an agreement. Let's just keep TPP as it is. Let's kind of put it aside. And you know, maybe at some point, the United States will reconsider its position. And if the US comes back, then maybe um, we can revive it. So that's one option. Another option is what's shorthand now being called the TPP-11. And that is that all the other countries of TPP, with the exception of the United States, come together and try and agree to TPP without the United States. And that's something that Australia and New Zealand, in particular, have been kind of championing, championing and saying it's something very useful to look at. Um, and I think that will be an issue that other um, countries, that 11, will discuss and try and figure out if that's really a realistic way forward. Other countries, I think, will um, start thinking about whether they should do bilateral agreements among um, um, other TPP members. In other words, you know, for example, just to name two countries in TPP, Mexico and Malaysia, they don't have a free trade agreement. But since through TPP, they've agreed to a lot of the same rules, um, they're considering whether they should embark on free trade area negotiations. And I think um, other countries will do the same. And finally, a number of countries, and here I would just highlight Vietnam, they've kind of decided that they're just going to go ahead and institute some of the reforms called for in TPP, even though there won't be a trade agreement. And that is because they think the market opening type of, of reforms that TPP called for are in their own national interest to go ahead and to implement. And so those are kind of some of the alternatives that are being considered. For the United States, we'll have to see what lies ahead um, as Dan mentioned in his opening remarks, this administration has made it clear um, that they have a preference for what we call bilateral agreements, an agreement for the, between the United States and one other country, as opposed to kind of group agreements, the United States and 11 other countries or three other countries or whatever. And so um, some people think that this administration may embark on bilateral negotiations with different TPP countries and other countries as well. Um, as a way forward, the question will be how the other countries would respond to such an overture, um, particularly given that they would want to know what we would expect from them in a negotiation, particularly if the United States was going to ask countries that were members of TPP to do more than they did um, in TPP. Yeah. So that's a long way of answering your question. Um, but I, I, in short, it's kind of a work in progress. People, countries are, are kind of working through the new reality and seeing how they can move forward. But I think all with the conviction that what was agreed to in TPP, there are a lot of really useful and relevant and strong disciplines and rules that should be preserved, should be advanced, and should be captured somehow what, either in trade agreements or in national laws or regulations. Thank you. That was a very excellent answer. Let me, let me turn to you, Ambassador Oshima. What, what does it mean 
for Japan, the, the mm. U.S. withdrawing from TPP? Mm. What does it mean for the Abe government, and what does it mean for prospects for a U.S.-Japan FTA or, or, or some other architecture, <laughs> Japan-Korea perhaps, uh, Japan-Korea, China? Okay, well, let me thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Akerson. Let me try to respond to your questions, and I'm sure the people uh, I've, who are before, before me uh, have uh, similar questions. First of all, I would like to uh, second what uh, Wendy said about the meaning of TPP. Although I was not involved in negotiations, I, I, it's one of the highest standard uh, uh, multilateral trading investment uh, rules, which was a, a great achievement and we should have hopefully uh, uh, put into effect. But unfortunately, the circumstances is, as you mentioned. But I just wanted to introduce a new element, or I, I, I shouldn't say new, but an interesting element, which came out of the recent meeting between our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Abe, and your President, President Trump. And I, I should have prepared a document, but uh, since I, uh, I, I don't have the handouts, let me just read the relevant paragraph from that uh, joint statement uh, agreed by the two leaders on uh, February 10th. I don't want to bore you, but uh, please uh, listen very carefully because it's very uh, carefully crafted uh, document. Uh, just uh, three sentences. The United States and Japan reaffirmed the importance of both deepening their trade and investment relations and of their continued efforts in promoting trade, economic growth, and high standards <coughs> throughout the Asia Pacific region. Toward this end, and noting that the United States has withdrawn from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the leaders pledged to explore how best to accomplish these shared objectives. This will include discussions between the United States and Japan on a bilateral framework, as well as Japan continuing to advance regional progress on the basis of existing initiatives. What do these three sentences say? It's a very interesting uh, formulation. We, we, it does start with the acknowledgement that the TPP, a US government has withdrawn itself from TPP. But it's not, that's not the end of the story. What the Japanese government is trying to say, if I understand this correctly, is still hopeful that eventually the Japanese government will be able, together with the other uh, 11 members, the other 10 members, including uh, uh, on top of Japan, to try to persuade and convince the United States to reconsider its current position and join TPP. In the meanwhile, in the meantime, we are aware that the current administration is seeking uh, a bilateral approach. We will see how it goes, because as somebody mentioned earlier, it's still a work in progress. Yes you have not yet established the team for negotiations. So you have not seen, you meaning the American side, have not yet ex showed us how you are going to approach it. We have heard all these uh, uh, abstract uh, expressions that you would approach on a bilateral basis, but we do not know how that kind of negotiations will be uh, conducted, uh, in what order, with whom, all these things. So we are still working. In the meantime, we have established between Japan and the United States a framework which will be dealing with all sorts of economic issues, not only trade and investment, uh, under the rubric of uh, uh, two chairmen, one the prime, Deputy Prime Minister Asso on, on Japan's side and on the American side, uh, Vice President Pence. We will see how this dialogue will, this dialogue will continue to focus and create uh, whatever uh, avenues for Japan and US to conduct its business on the areas of trade and investment in the region, which could include our uh, discussions on TPP, which could include some kind of bilateral discussions. We will see, but first, uh, we should not, at this point, uh, think that TPP is totally gone. It's still there, it's a very good agreement. And we were hoping that you could be sort of eventually brought into effect with our effort. I, I am <coughs> holding out hope, just like you, and that the administration is going to 
discover its folly and, and, and recognize how important this is and, and get back to it uh, at some point. How about in Korea? All right, so Korea wasn't a charter member. It's not one of the 12, but it was widely assumed to be the first country to accede to the TPP if and when that was to be, uh, t take effect. Uh, what, what, what does it mean for Korea? And I, I, got, I, have, I just have to say, I mean, is there, is there a little bit of bittersweetness to it in the sense that uh, the Korea and the United States have a trade agreement? Um, and the United States and Japan don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, the, I agree, uh, but uh, it's a, a bittersweet, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a taste, uh, uh, but the, as a, a trade you know, a professional, uh, I wanted to see uh, TPP uh, earlier than later. Actually, uh, there is a reason why uh, uh, Korea uh, comes late uh, in exceeding, uh, in uh, negotiating TPP together with Japan, but uh, it coincides with uh, our uh, reorganization and also other uh, FTA negotiation with China, for example. And uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, now uh, it's time for Korea to join TPP uh, later uh, as a equal member, as an original member. I think in that regard, uh, Korea is very happy to see that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, uh, I, I'm of the uh, same view of Wendy's in in exploring pathways after uh, United States uh, withdrawal from TPP. But I think uh, the, the, the editorial, I remember editorial, Bloomberg editorial, uh, rest in peace TPP. But uh, I think uh, rest on shelf TPP <laughs> is better term and uh, a better description uh, to me. And uh, now yeah, President Trump uh, seems to uh, be a, a focused on uh, upgrading bilateral, a uh, trilateral actually, uh, NAFTA. And uh, well, uh, the uh, NAFTA upgrading uh, will be uh, uh, borrowing uh, uh, the contents uh, uh, the NAFTA contents are of TPP, agreed on already. And uh, uh, the high quality uh, FTA with Japan uh, would be great uh, for the next bilateral for the United States. And then uh, Malaysia and uh, Vietnam and Malaysia would be uh, new uh, FTAs for the United States. Hmm. I think. Uh, I think by the time the uh, United States will uh, think over again and revisit the TPP, uh, uh, then I think uh, we can uh, draw, uh, uh, take back uh, TPP uh, from the shelf. Mm -hmm. you know, if I may bring up, uh, so this, this meeting in Chile that's planned for the middle of March, Korea was invited, as was China, and as was the United States. Um, so are, are you suggesting that uh, maybe Korea has an opportunity to be a charter member, given this pause, given the U.S. reluctance to go forward, the withdrawal, if the U.S. is to get back in, or even if the U.S. doesn't get back in, uh, the TPP would be more significant if Korea were in it. Uh, would you accept uh, an invitation to join the 11? Oh, well, um, uh, I have to consult with my uh, <laughs> colleagues in Seoul. Uh, actually, I'm a little bit away from Washington, D.C. and uh, uh, trade you know, authorities. I'm, I'm serving uh, Consul General here, but in my personal opinion, uh, I think uh, there are many uh, uh, professionals uh, very positive uh, about uh, our participation. Let's, let's talk about the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or I guess it ASEAN plus six, the RCEP has been sort of characterized in the U.S. press and by um, U.S. politicians as an alternative to the TPP. Uh, I'm not sure that I really buy that, that's an alternative. I, I know that the TPP mem uh, negotiating countries that were also negotiating in RCEP wanted both. Um, do, you, do you think the RCEP uh, can, can go forward? Um, relatively quickly, and do you think it's something that's mutually exclusive with, uh, with, uh, with the TPP? Uh, I'll start with you. Well, answer. yeah, um, since uh, we are, we mean in Japan, I don't work for the government anymore, but anyway, we in Japan are members of both negotiations for uh, TPP and ANSEP, so maybe I should go first. Um, as far as I understand that, I don't think ANSEP is an alternative to uh, to TPP because they have they have two different uh, memberships at uh, two different uh, levels of uh, 
uh, target level. Ambition. Uh, ambition, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and so um, I don't think just because TPP is uh, on the shelf, uh, we should just go to RCEP and have it uh, concluded at whatever level. That's not the approach we should take. We should try to, of course, push our RCEP, but try to have it at a higher level, uh, taking uh, the TPP as a good uh, model. And, and I think that should be very hopeful for the region, but I, I don't think it would be able to replace uh, TPP. So from our point of view, we have dual, dual objective. One is to push for reconsideration and eventual uh, bringing into force of TPP on one hand, and on the other, push for RCEP at a higher level of achievement. Yeah. Yeah. Wendy, what do, you, what do you think about the, the RCEP in, in, in relative to uh, well, the first, U.S. outlook? Yeah, first I would just make the point, I don't think um, the two negotiations are you know, mutually exclusive or they're rival agreements. I think both could coexist in a world. And as Shitaro mentioned, you know, there's different membership. Um, they'll probably have different rules coming out. And as long as those rules don't conflict with each other, then I think it's okay for the region. Um, I think it's safe to say that, um, there is, that there is a renewed interest in the RCEP negotiations. Their next round of talks will be the end of February in Kobe in Japan. Um, China in particular, which is a member of RCEP, has been talking more about RCEP and the importance of trying to conclude these negotiations, which started in 2012 by the end of this year. However, RCEP, like any trade negotiation, faces a lot of challenges. And one of the challenges is, it's similar to the challenge that we faced in TPP, is that when you have, in TPP's case, 12 countries, and in RCEP's case, 16 countries negotiating, that's a lot of countries to negotiate with. Each comes to the table with a different set of priorities and sensitivities, and each has a different level of economic development. And I think that's even more acute in the RCEP negotiations when you look at the membership. Um, I also think that another huge challenge for RCEP is the partic participation of India in the RCEP negotiations. India traditionally in trade negotiations, let's just say, is not very forthcoming. Um, <laughs> I'll be a diplomat here. And it's, you know, they've, they've really posed a challenge, I think, um, at least from what I understand, for the other RCEP countries. So the key question for RCEP for me is not whether they conclude, can they conclude an agreement by the end of the year, because anyone can, can conclude a deal, but can they conclude a meaningful deal? And I, for one, really hope that they use the coming um, rounds of negotiations to really try and kind of raise the standards of the agreement and you know, raise the liberalization rates of, of the tariff cuts among the countries of RCEP. And I think if they are successful, once again, that would contribute to um, the Asia-Pacific becoming more integrated economically and also um, would um, make the Asia-Pacific just a more open um, um, region for trade and investment. And, and would the United States be able to participate? I really don't see that happening. I didn't yeah. see it happening under the Obama administration yeah. just because the standards of RCEP will be much lower than the U.S. Congress yeah. would ever allow an administration to, jo to, to, to join. But also, I would say under the Trump administration, if they don't like TPP, they're really not going to like RCEP. Right. So, so the TPP was often characterized as uh, you know, uh, eventually evolving into something like a free trade area of the Asia Pacific. And, uh, and uh, it's a living agreement, and other countries could join, and things could change. And I, I, I thought it was an excellent model as an alternative to the multilateral system that seems to have broken down the consensus-based approach. So are you s saying then that RCEP wouldn't be able to be that vehicle to the to a uh, free trade area of the Asia Pacific, or to uh, it, it, is it a living agreement? Is it something that other countries could join? Oh, I think one thing about RCEP that is very clear, I think they're very intent on kind of open accession and making it easy for other countries to join. But once again, the question is, what are you joining? What are the rules? What are the standards? Yeah. And if they're so low as to be so, you know, even close to the WTO standards, then, you know, countries have to question, is this really yeah. the model for really, you know, moving forward, moving ahead in the trade world? So, 
Uh, Ambassador Kim, the 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 the, uh, the RCEP. We were talking. About, we were comparing the TPP and the RCEP. Now let's compare the RCEP to the Korea, Japan, China uh, yeah. negotiation. Are there big differences there, and can you negotiate both of them simultaneously? Well, is uh, uh, you know, is Korea is very uh, uh, active in uh, uh, negotiating FTAs with uh, major uh, trading partners. So actually, uh, we are uh, most ahead uh, in this regard. And uh, we are, of course, we are participating in our same negotiation, also uh, Korea, Japan, uh, China trilateral. And also, we uh, concluded uh, FTA with China uh, after uh, Chorus and uh, Korea EU FTA. And uh, as Wendy pointed out, uh, RCEP is a, a worthwhile initiative uh, centering around ASEAN 10 countries plus six uh, trading partners of ASEAN. Actually, uh, it, it, compared with TPP, uh, uh, RCEP is for short of standards, uh, is a lower, stands for uh, much lower standards of uh, rules and uh, market liberalization. So uh, it cannot replace uh, TPP. Uh, so I think it's a leadership. A leadership uh, should be in high, uh, high quality FTAs. I think the chorus is, uh, uh, belongs to that category. And NAFTA, if it is upgraded, I think uh, is a high quality uh, FTA. If Japan joins uh, uh, FTA with, uh, a bilateral FTA with, uh, United States, I think uh, three FTA will lead uh, uh, a, a trade and uh, investment regime in the Asia Pacific. Well, if I may just perspective, yes. Yeah, um, I think it's important for us to once again uh, think what is contained in TPP, which is uh, called as the high standard uh, new uh, uh, an agreement. And there are certain elements in TPP which we have not yet seen in any other types of um, mega FTAs or even WTO. Uh, for instance, um, digital economy rules, which is totally new. And I think in, in, in the reflection of the realities on the ground of the business activities in the region and elsewhere, we do need uh, rules in this area. Uh, Another example is uh, very uh, substantial rules on SMEs, mm -hmm. which are very important uh, drivers of the economies in Syria and elsewhere. So if we had uh, you know, pursued uh, any of the regional agreements, including CCK or RCEP, we need to keep this in mind that we need to have a high standard uh, agreement uh, taking the PP as a model. So, well, yes, Japan is in, uh, taking part in both uh, CG, what we call CGK-JK um, trilateral agreement and RCEP. But we, we would very much like to have a high standard uh, agreement in both cases. If I can just make yeah, one please. more comment on RCEP, just commenting on something that Giwan said, because I think it's, it's really true, and there's a lot of um, kind of a misperception about RCEP and TPP that a lot of people have portrayed that RCEP, you know, is the China-dominated regional free trade agreement, and TPP was the U.S.-dominated regional free trade agreement, and the two were competing, and they were rivals, and which one was going to win out. But um, what Giwan said is really important, and that is that RCEP is really grounded in the 10 ASEAN countries, that, that they are the, the, the glue, the basis for RCEP and that the other six countries, including China and India, you know, joined, but in no way is this a China-dominated negotiation. And I would argue the same thing on TPP. While the U.S. was very active and an enthusiastic negotiator in TPP, you know, the other TPP partners joined because they also wanted to work on a high-standard deal that went way beyond the rules of the WTO. And so each of those countries felt like they got enough out of the TPP deal to go home and to sell it domestically. And I would, you know, just remind everyone, I mean, Japan recently passed TPP in the diet. I mean, when we first started negotiating with Japan, um, 
um, on TPP before they joined, if you ever told me then that within one month Japan would pass TPP in the diet and the U.S. would withdraw, I would have <laughs> never believed you. And that's kind of how it played out. And so I'd like to think this story isn't over yet, no. but um, it's, it's, it's kind of a stunning outcome. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree with you. Do, do either of you want to make any other comments that you, that you I, thought of afterward? Yeah, can I sure, one, one, one element which was referred to earlier uh, during the introduction speech by the president of the uh, Korea Society, which is the uh, uh, border adjustment tax mm. now being uh, bandied about in the United States. Uh, we were talking about trade negotiations. We were saying that the work is in progress, but because your team is not yet, uh, your team, meaning American team, is not yet there. But more importantly, whatever happens to this uh, discussion here in the United States on the border adjustment tax in the context of the tax package will have a tremendous impact on the way how trade is conducted, how business is conducted. And therefore, unless we see the outcome, in my view, of this debate in the United States, it will be very difficult to have a serious uh, trade negotiations or investment treaty negotiations without knowing what kind of uh, business environment U.S. economy would be under. So, so the fact that the uh, U.S. Congress and the administration are contemplating a, a new a tax overhaul that includes these border adjustable mm -hmm. taxes mm -hmm. creates too uncertain an environment to, to negotiate well, a bilateral? Well, un unless we know what kind of business environment the new tax package would uh, present to uh, business people from abroad, uh, traders, investors, yeah. uh, it would be very difficult to have a trade or an investment agreement on basis of that kind yeah. of a, a environment. Yeah, I, I, I think that, that it's going to take a while before they, they come up with something. So we may, maybe well, in a prolonged period yeah. of uncertainty. As, as a foreign country, I don't think we have any, you know, some, anything to say on what's happening on the domestic uh, side of your uh, deliberations. But I'm just saying that that would have an impact yeah, on yeah. The future uh, negotiations. Yeah. That absolutely makes sense. Ambassador Kim. Yeah, I think uh, I, I share the view. Uh, and, uh, concerns about the uh, uh, border uh, adjustment tax actually is import tax is a uh, and is a uh, is a across the board or uh, is a barriers at uh, the importers. So I think uh, uh, many uh, challenges in the WTO uh, will be coming. Uh, I think two three years. Then I think uh, there will be some correction orders uh, to make uh, U.S. law. Uh, consistent with WTO. I think it is a matter of time, but two to three years. And uh, uh, another is uh, uh, currency, uh, is, uh, you know, is, uh, uh, is very, uh, it raised uh, a lot of uh, uncertainty uh, on the part of uh, many countries, including uh, six countries on the US Treasury uh, uh, watch list. Uh, four are, are Asian countries, uh, China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and uh, uh, two in Europe, uh, Germany and Switzerland. Uh, basically, uh, it is due to uh, uh, enormous uh, trade deficit on the uh, on U.S. side. Actually, a uh, most part uh, incurred uh, with uh, China is, uh, I think, is a uh, 350 billion dollar trade deficit with China. Actually, uh, uh, which exceeds uh, every total of other uh, deficits in the world. That is, uh, that is my impression. So I think is a bilateral uh, trade relations with, uh, between uh, United States and China is very important and very well managed. And uh, uh, currency uh, thing, I think, is, you see, uh, quantitative easing matters to currency. And uh, US Fed rate hikes matters to currency. And also stimulus package matters to currency. And uh, uh, in Korea, actually, uh, aging society and, and demographic change uh, uh, makes uh, uh, surplus of uh, uh, current account uh, you know, surplus and, and uh, low oil prices. I mean, all those factors affect uh, uh, current account surplus and currency. So there are much more uh, reasons other than uh, mercantilist purposes. So I think we need to differentiate uh, the reason behind, uh, I mean, the uh, currency fluctuation as well. 
Yes. Uh, yes, just, just a quick point on, on the currency issue. Uh, the two leaders, when they met, they agreed that uh, with respect to Japan and US uh, size on this issue, uh, it will be discussed uh, by the two ministers who would be responsible for this issue, meaning uh, ministers of Treasury, mm -hmm. uh, Treasury ministers. So that's the, way it was, when it, that's the way it should be and that's the way it will be. Yeah. Well, the issue's been around for a long time, and it's, it's a very difficult uh, phenomenon to measure. I agree with you that there are lots of determinants. Quantitative easing had a lot to do with it. Just you know, lots of policies uh, can affect uh, the, the value of the currency. And I, I, uh, I don't think we've come up with a, with a solution. I'm not sure that we necessarily n need a solution. What's, what the, administration, the Trump administration is talking about now is uh, this whole uh, Schumer idea of um, treating uh, 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 an undervalued currency as a as a subsidy, countervailable under the CBD law. To me, that's a good political solution for the time being because there's no currency manipulation going on. Very few industries are, can demonstrate that they're injured. So let's you know kick the can down the road. Uh, uh, but you bring up currency, which is a point of contention, uh, well, with the U.S. and Japan, but particularly the U.S. and China over the past few years. Um, and I wanted to talk about challenges in the Asia-Pacific. Uh, there are challenges uh, to uh, deciding how to move forward with trade agreements because of the uncertain climate. What about um, a trade war? What, about, what if the United States were to levy duties on China? And we're, you, you talked about a bilateral trade account with China, but we're in a globalized economy. Half of the value of what we import from China is Korean, Japanese, uh, Brazilian, Australian. Uh, so um, it seems to me that uh, it could spark some sort of a, a tit-for-tat response that ripples all throughout the Asia-Pacific region. So I was, uh, anybody, anybody want to start on that? Well, yeah, I'll start. I mean, I think what's clear, there, there's, look, there's an imbalance between the US and China trade. There are a lot of um, issues that need to be addressed um, between the U.S. and China on the trade front. Um, progress has been made, but there are a lot of, um, you know, really problematic issues, um, including subsidies, including, you know, forced technology transfer, um, including, you know, the role of state-owned enterprises, and, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, that said, the question is then how do you, how do you deal with that? And I know, you know, there's so much frustration, and I know that the Trump administration clearly is focusing on this issue. Um, during the campaign, a number of solutions or a number of policy measures were put forward to deal with China. One um, was calling, you know, labeling China a currency manipulator, and, um, and then, you know, following the procedures under our statutes once that um, um, title was ascribed to them. Second, there was talk, um, but we don't hear it anymore, about just imposing a 45 percent tariff on all imports from China. There was also discussion about scrutinizing Chinese investment in the United States. Um, and um, there was also talk about using our trade laws more aggressively to address Chinese subsidies and address Chinese dumping and Chinese overcapacity, fallouts from J China's overcapacity um, um, in certain sectors such as steel. And we don't know how this is all going to play out and what exactly this administration is going to end up doing vis-a-vis um, -vis China, and I think we'll, we'll need to wait to see what happens. My experience in dealing with China on the trade front, though, is that Whatever we do, and particularly if we do something that's not consistent with, with our obligations under you know, the trading rules, um, that China's not going to wait to take us to dispute settlement. If we impose a 45 percent tariff against China, either across the board or just on a handful of products, and we violate our WTO obligations, um, I think that they will, and they've made it very clear that they will just retaliate um, immediately and proportionally. And I think once that happens, um, then you, you can really see a spiral 
happening and, and a trade war erupting. And unfortunately, it will be the Japan and the Koreas and the other countries in the Asia Pacific that will be hurt the quickest because of all the, inter the integrated trading relationships and the fact that China is the, lar is the largest trading partner for most countries in the Asia Pacific. So I'm trying to be hopeful um, that a lot of these um, concerns now are being um, um, recognized in the administration. I know the, you know, President Trump is meeting with CEOs now all the time, trying to hear more about their priorities and their concerns. And um, um, I'm hopeful that what, whatever policy action is taken vis-a-vis -vis China, that it will be thoughtful and hopefully it will be within the rules of the trading system. Excellent. Excellent. Can yes, I, um, Thank you, Wendy, for bringing up WTO. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> I, I learned it all from you. you know, <laughs> the word of WTO was only mentioned uh, earlier once before she mentioned it because we, are, we have gone into directly to FTAs and other recent uh, you know, mega FTAs, that kind of thing. But we have to remember, the world trade is governed first and foremost by the rules of WTO. We are all members. And we, the WTO has served us very well for many 20 years since its existence. Uh, the only, uh, this, what should I say, uh, uh, problem it has is the fact that it's not moving forward in terms of new liberalization negotiations. That's why people have moved into other negotiating forums like the Bilder FTAs or Mega FTAs. But if you, have to, you have to remember, WTO does have the rules, and also the dispute settlement process to deal with uh, those uh, disputes which arise from the interpretation or application of the rules. So as she mentioned, uh, yes, um, there are also the trade disputes already existing uh, and could emerge in the near future. But if people could keep itself to the rules of the WTO, including the dispute settlement process, then we would be able to avoid a trade war as such, which would be much more uh, civilized, should I say, and which would be beneficial to all of us who are members of the WTO. You know, uh, in the United States, we've seen a lot of, there was a lot of opposition to the TPP. And uh, I think it's because, you know, trade agreements are not just about border barriers anymore, as Wendy described, and as, as, as has been described here. Uh, it's much more about uh, global standards, uh, it's, uh, harmonizing regulations, it's, it's, we're engaging in reforms that go beyond the border. And what's th what that's done, I think, is, is a, it's incited people in the United States that never really cared about trade, but they do care about data privacy or internet uh, privacy or, um, you know, just a particular issue. And they, so they don't think about the TPP holistically, they think about their issue and they, and they react. The Europeans have the same sort of problem uh, in the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership. In, in Korea and in Japan, do, do you have to contend with people who object to some of these, what, these 21st century sort of uh, uh, rules of these trade agreements? Oh, well, it's, uh, actually, thanks to uh, Wendy and his uh, successful high-quality uh, FTA with Korea, Actually, uh, Korea has transformed uh, into really, really a global mind, uh, mindset uh, country. Uh, actually, as I mentioned, uh, is, uh, Korea is very active in uh, extending FTAs. Actually, the only way, because our uh, trade volume uh, is almost the uh, same size of G GDP, $1 trillion, uh, more than $1 trillion now. Is, uh, but uh, actually, so we uh, heavily dependent on uh, export performance and uh, trade performance overall. So we, uh, we uh, strongly believe in uh, form a uh, multilateral trading system, WTO and TPP, or TTIP and uh, uh, bilaterals. Mm -hmm. So I think that if we go successful with TPP and TTIP, I think a positive impact on DDA, which is stalled now, but we have a very bilateral segments uh, in, in negotiation. Then I think that will uh, elevate uh, the rules and standards in multilateral level. So, and also at the same time, uh, as uh, Ambassador Oshima mentioned, uh, there is a dispute settlement uh, uh, mechanism in WTO. Actually, this is uh, uh, after fix. I mean, uh, we need to uh, we need to f uh, uh, 
make rules first and uh, manage uh, good uh, uh, free, and tr free and fair trade. And then I think we can uh, make after fix in the tri tri dispute settlement uh, mechanism. So in that regard, in that regard uh, is a very important multilateral uh, dispute settlement and uh, negotiating a mechanism. But uh, 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 the point you raised uh, is uh, the chorus includes uh, a lot of high standard provisions, including uh, cross-border data flow. Mm -hmm. Actually, that was one of most frequent issues uh, I have to see Wendy when I was in uh, Washington, <laughs> D.C. So she always asked something uh, from Korean side because uh, uh, this is a, a very uh, high standard that uh, unprecedented uh, provisions uh, included in the bilateral. Mm. Uh, and a lot more than uh, cross-border data flow. It's a big data analysis you yeah. need. And uh, high stand a platinum standard IPL and uh, labor and environmental standards, competition, e-commerce, mm. and, and uh, uh, ISD. Uh, ISDS. <laughs> ISD as well. Yeah. <laughs> we actually uh, is a hard a proponent uh, to Australia on this issue as well. Sure. She was e extremely happy about that. <laughs> but you know, is a Korea is a really front runner uh, of uh, all uh, standard high quality provisions. Yeah. Yeah. If I may just uh, quickly uh, comment on what, uh, what, where we stand in Japan, as Wendy mentioned, uh, the fact that uh, the Japanese parliament uh, ratified uh, DPP, that, which means that although, yes, we do have opposition to uh, DPP from two different uh, sources, um, to, in general, exaggerating or simplifying. One is, of course, the old uh, traditional protectionist uh, forces of agriculture, mm. but that was overcome uh, thanks to the good negotiations and the result uh, contained in DPP. And also the others is the modern type of uh, new uh, resistance, uh, anti-globalist uh, type mm -hmm. of uh, uh, resistance. But that was also uh, overcome uh, in Japan. So I think the Japanese uh, people on the whole, uh, on, uh, in terms of the majority of people, <laughs> understand the importance of uh, further liberalizing in terms of uh, trade, investment, and in these new areas as well. Um, having negotiated with both countries, my perception is it, it wasn't as much of these kind of 21st century issues which engendered opposition in Korea and Japan. It really came from the farmers mm. and the agriculture community. Yeah. And for both countries, it was extremely tough to negotiate opening in the agricultural sector. And both governments took enormous political risks to put those issues and those products on the table and to um, you know, reach outcomes with the United States and in TPP's case with other countries. And um, I would just say I have enormous respect for both countries just watching their process and seeing what my counterparts were going through day by day as they were you know, discussing pork or cheese or you know, meat or rice. <laughs> um, very, very sensitive issues in these countries. Absolutely. So uh, one of the things we talked about as, as, as a challenge in the Asia-Pacific uh, was trade war. Um, talked a little bit about it, but is there anything else uh, on, on the geopolitical realm, perhaps, or uh, other things that keep you up at night that you worry about uh, uh, that will impede the growth of this fastest growing region of the world? Um, what, 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 what's, what's concerning you, Ambassador Kim? Uh, well, it's, uh, <laughs> um, actually, the, as, I, as I just pointed out, is, uh, Korea is uh, heavily dependent on uh, performance of trade. Is, I think we need a very uh, stable uh, trading environment and rules. Actually, China is a common challenge, even though we have a, a FTA with China, but is the standards are uh, uh, much less uh, compared with the uh, Coros FTA. Mm. Um, but uh, you know, is uh, something uh, rule, uh, you know, based uh, uh, mechanism is better than nothing uh, there. So we are uh, kind of uh, building blocks uh, with uh, China. But you know, is a very uh, sometimes uh, uh, our trade relations affected by uh, some political uh, uh, decision like that, like that, uh, you know, uh, deployment uh, in Korea. Mm. Actually, uh, China isn't happy about that. So uh, uh, what they use is uh, uh, retaliatory trade measures and, again, and also uh, 
uh, uh, retaliatory measures against the peoples and cultural exchange between us. So, I mean, this is a really, really a mix up of uh, economics and, uh, uh, and, and politics in, in the region. Mm -hmm. So I really, really want to see a good bilateral relations uh, between the United States and China mm -hmm. and for the benefits of all. That's here, here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, um, if I may, uh, not that I uh, sleep, uh, not that I don't sleep every night because of how I worry about these things, but there are a few things I do worry about, uh, yeah, which has to do with trade, and that is the fact that uh, if you go back to uh, in history, why do we have this uh, multilateral trading system? Uh, established uh, in 1947 by the GATT, then further developed uh, in, within RSWTO in 1995 because of the experience we had in the 1930s. And to pursue a uh, trade uh, relationship on a bilateral basis and trying to achieve a balance between the two, re regardless of the fact that the trade is effectively not a bilateral thing, it's a little bit reminiscent of uh, what we went through in the 30s in mm -hmm. terms of a uh, huge contraction of uh, world trade. And that is something we should try to avoid uh, through whatever means uh, possible and always reminding ourselves uh, why we do have WTO and before that, that. Uh, so that's what I would want to say at this point in time. Yeah, I agree with that too. When did you want to? Add anything to this? Um, a lot of things worry me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in, in, uh, in one minute. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, so I'm not going to go through all of them. But the thing I would just share is that I do believe that at some point the U.S. will kind of come back to TPP in some form at some time. And what concerns me is that when we kind of get to that point, um, I think the other, what worries me is that the other countries in Asia Pacific will have already moved on, will have reached deals among themselves, and will kind of be a little less interested in the kind of rules or the kind of standards um, that we would want, you know, them to, them, them to agree to. Yeah, exactly. It won't happen with Japan. We'll wait for wait. you. <laughs> I can, hear, I can hear, hear a love song in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. And what I'd like to ask is, if you raise your hand, I'll call on you, and if you could identify yourself and get to your question quickly and direct it somewhere. You. Hi. Hi. Oh wait, wait, wait! Please wait for the mic. Sorry. Hi, my name is Lawrence Brenner. I actually have a question because the U.S., Korea, and Japan are the th some of the three largest exporters of cultural and media products. So I was curious about how uh, the lack of participation in the Trade Pacific Partnership could actually affect the cultural exchange with the uh, cultural and media products. As I've also read, uh, Nintendo has actually had some concerns with uh, some of their products uh, going uh, throughout the U.S. and other regions. So you're asking, uh, will U.S. exporters, or will exporters among the three uh, have difficulty penetrating cultural barriers? Uh, no, continuing, since the cultural barriers aren't really existing in this case, because there are such things as movies and, and games and uh, pro uh, popular culture properties, is that how would items from these with uh, such things as trade books? Uh, barriers and stuff like that actually be effective. Okay. Well, maybe I can start. Yeah. I mean, I think you know, trade in the types of products that you're, you're, you've raised um, benefit from a lot of different provisions in trade agreements, um, particularly with respect to intellectual property protection. Mm -hmm. And here, you know, the number of years that copyright protection would be given to, um, um, you know, content or to a movie or to, you know, to software. And so in the TPP, for example, we agreed to 70 years of copyright protection. Um, and that's something now that countries will not be obligated to do. In addition, with respect to some of these products, um, you know, there, there are tariff cuts that will not be um, 
um, attained, um, and so tariff barriers will will remain. Um, and there are probably other provisions too that I'm not um, that are not coming to my mind right now. So TPP, in a lot of ways, have benefited you know a whole range of products and sectors, goods, services. Um, agricultural um, exports and a lot of those benefits now and those rules, um, if they're not agreed to and they don't come to fruition in some form, um, exporters will not benefit from them. If I might just, you know, sure. the same thing. I totally agree with what Wendy said, but put it in a, in a different angle. We, if we have TPP, we will have all these benefits that she just mentioned. The fact that we do not have TPP yet it may have a little time lag until when we do, that's not negatively impact on the current situation. It, it may, we would not be able to benefit from the agreement more, but the fact that we don't have it now doesn't negatively impact the situation. Hopefully, uh, the, the things would, the exchanges would be furthered even without TPP, but it would be even better if we do have TPP. Questions? Uh, maybe I'll take a few this time. Um, okay, you, you, both, each of you, you, you and the man behind you. Hello, my name is Endo. Uh, this is an indirect, indirect question for Mr. Kim. Uh, I met one Korean college student missionary, and uh, she said, we learned history at school about how the Japanese abused us when they ruled. The uh, Korean government is teaching their children hatred against Japan. And that very negative thought with the thought, country Sir, nation. Yes. Do, is, do you have a question? Oh, yes. Please. So please stop teaching uh, them hatred, teach more pride and hope and uh, uh, okay. Okay. kindness. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> The man, but yeah, the man behind you, please. So, um, I'd like to ask you about, my name is Paul Renke. Uh, you mentioned about the agricultural difficulties between the PTP countries. Um, I was actually in Switzerland and Germany at the time when they were trying to negotiate this. And I know that genetically modified food was a big issue. And uh, unfortunately, the US is uh, much more for genetically modified food. For example, as far as I know, soya beans are practically 100% genetically modified, corn is almost 100% genetically modified in the US. <coughs> Whereas, for example, in Switzerland, that's a real crime of Germany. So um, these are very important details, and I think we should respect the farmers, because this is about the future of humanity. If we genetically modify all the food, we might just uh, stop producing food at some point, because it's not going to work. Okay. No. Thank you. Uh, we'll take another question as well, and then we'll uh, divvy them up. Yeah, yes. Uh, it's not that we're not going to get to the question. I just want to have a few to... Yes, um, I have a question about uh, China. Ms. Cutler already alluded to the issues that China has. Um, I'm quoting here from a World Economic Forum enabling trade report that China remains one of the most closed markets with average applied tariffs of 11.1%, which ranks at 126 out of 136 countries in terms of market access. Now, Mr. Ekinson, uh, how is that not cheating? And then for the other two gentlemen, what steps could China take to uh, get rid of this, these barriers? Or which ones would you like to get them to get rid of first? Because after all, your nations are uh, very important trading partners. Thank you. Is it China? How about China? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, well, you asked me a question, and I'm the moderator, but uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll decide whether to answer that. But uh, maybe there's fewer hostile questions on this. <laughs> <laughs> what? what did you say? <laughs> uh, right, back, right back there. We, we're going to get to your questions. Thank you. Antonio Parenti with the European Union. I have a question with, uh, <clears throat> one, uh, with Mr. Kattler and one with uh, Oshima san. Um, if TPP is dead and Japan and the uh, United States follow a bilateral route, what do you think the United States could ask Japan more than done, has been done in TPP to reach a bilateral agreement? And Oshima-san, will Japan be ready to pay that? Okay. 
So we have a few questions here. Does anybody want to start on any of those questions? Well, uh, I'll start with uh, uh, the question uh, raised by a gentleman, Japanese gentleman there. Well, uh, past, his past history issue uh, is one of a thorny issue. Uh, I think both countries, both leaders, should take good care of. Uh, and also, uh, there are a large uh, civil society uh, movement there. So uh, sometimes uh, political leaders uh, feel difficult uh, you know, in meeting uh, demands of uh, civil society. But uh, nevertheless, I think uh, you have uh, uh, maybe uh, partly wrong information from su such a, a college missionary student. I think uh, he, may be, uh, he, may, he may have other ways to please you, but I think uh, there are, there are uh, uh, some past history issues, but we don't uh, foster hatred against Japanese people. But the uh, interaction and on both ends, I think, aggravate uh, sometimes. Sometimes uh, promotes a good feeling each other. So uh, the best thing we, we can do is uh, promote good feeling, a good future for young children. And that is my answer to you. A and uh, uh, well, is um, GMO. I think is I think is Wendy has a. a a view on this, but I think I understand that GMO is a very critical issue between uh, U.S. and uh, European standards. Uh, uh, I think the uh, United States uh, use GMO uh, because the, uh, they expect food shortage uh, soon, so uh, uh, genetic engineering is a kind of pathway uh, to achieve uh, some uh, well-fed uh, population globally. But at the same time, uh, there is a safety standards raised, uh, as European Union uh, does. Actually, it is a, a very a vocal, and also we need to respect uh, the, the concerns there. So I think uh, U.S. Congress has uh, many uh, lobbying uh, you know, influence uh, on this regard. So there are some uh, congressional uh, uh, you know, the, uh, partisan politics intervenes uh, interpreting uh, GMO issues, but at the same time, uh, I think they are uh, minding uh, businesses, uh, competitive of businesses, GMO businesses, at the same time, safety issues. I think uh, there is uh, uh, some room uh, for more debate on this issue. Uh, uh, China. Um, um, well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, China is a really, really uh, 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 you know, big uh, trading partner at the same time. Uh, very difficult country because they have a, a market consumption, great consumption uh, in Chinese market. That affects, uh, that influences uh, uh, the trading partners, even though uh, the trading partners have fair rules to base their claims. But uh, we need, you need to ex uh, respect uh, because it's a great market, uh, uh, you know. So, we need to uh, enlarge, enlarge uh, rule, uh, high quality rules and market uh, liberalization through bilaterals, plurilaterals, multilaterals, and WTO. I mean, that's the only way I, I, I can say improve uh, uh, trade situation in China. Anybody want to? Okay, I'll, I'll try. Um, first, with respect to uh, the history issue, which um, Ambassador. Uh, mentioned uh, uh, from the Korean side, uh, from my side, uh, from the Japanese side, I, I, as I'm sure you know the sensitivity of the history issue between the two countries, and with Japan and other Asian countries as well. Um, but uh, with respect to Japan and Korea, two governments are addressing it uh, very courageously and uh, 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 forcefully. And, uh, and I think the answer lies in exactly the same uh, point made by the ambassador, which is that uh, better uh, uh, exchanges at all levels of peoples will be, and better understanding will be the best approach. With respect to GMO, um, having worked in, in, on and in WTO, the best uh, way to respond to this question is really reliance on scientific evidence. Uh, that's the rule. Uh, of course, there's dispute as to what is the science and the evidence, but, but that has to be decided among all sorts of, uh, through the, the existing procedure. But the basis is the scientific evidence. Well, with respect to China, yes, uh, I, I don't know the exact uh, level of uh, protection uh, on the average applied rate, but we have to understand the fact that all of the WTO members 
have the existing uh, MFN rates because of the negotiations they have gone through. I mean, you can have applied rates lower, but the uh, obligated uh, rates are after the negotiations. So China level of uh, tariff rates on average had been accepted by all the other members when it exceeded. Of course, the attempt on the part of WTO members is to try to reduce everybody's uh, tariff uh, barriers, but it has not been successful because the tea <coughs> Doha round has not been moving very much. That's why people are moving into other uh, forums like the FTAs or mega FTAs. But, uh, the question is, uh, the best approach, I would say, is to try to re reinvigorate the WTO liberalization negotiation in order to bring it down on a reciprocal basis. With the US and Japan, uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll see how it goes. As I mentioned earlier, we are still not yet uh, sure as to which, what kind of avenue we'll be proceeding between the two sides, and we'll see how it goes. If, if I could just reiterate what Ambassador Oshima said about uh, China, I mean, each country has its own, negotiated its own bound rate for industrial products, agricultural products. I, my understanding is that China's industrial rate is about 9%. Um, and, but the number that you cited as 112 out of 116 or something, that, that seems incorrect. Um, well, I, you, got, you got to know what you're, what you're, what exactly what you're citing, because. Yeah. So I, I, I would say there's, there's, there's plenty of opportunities to point to Chinese cheating, and looking at their, their bound tariff rates is not one of them. That's not really cheating. That's, that was negotiated, but doing other things might be, might constitute a violation of their WTO commitments and. We've brought many cases against China at the WTO and prevailed, and we use our anti-dumping and our countervailing duty laws against them. So I, I don't think that's the best example of China cheating, is what I'm saying. Um, more questions? Yes, the, the man right there, and then uh, the guy in the red shirt here. It, just a question about one of the opening remarks, I believe. Um, Ambassador Cutler, it was you who cited widespread amazement in Asia that the US had withdrawn from TPP. Why do you think there was that level of surprise, given how closely the campaign was followed by media everywhere on the planet? Sanders was against it. Clinton came out against it. Trump was certainly against it. And I don't recall seeing a single senator putting up their hand, saying they would vote for ratification. So what fell down in terms of people's understanding? Why was it such a surprise? I mean, the only thing missing was the priest pronouncing the last rites. <laughs> uh, let's, let's take another one, too. That, that's a good question. Um, the, the guy in the red shirt there. Is there any other hands, too? Uh, hi, Chris Schaefer here. Um, so my question is, is the border adjustment tax, is that unambiguously bad for trade, or is the issue more in the uncertainty of whether it will look more like a tariff versus a value-added tax? Uh, sir, uh, this man in the second row here. Uh, I'm Tom Nugent. Uh, my question is, how is the, uh, the management of American or perhaps other companies uh, responding in this period of uncertainty? Um, I'm thinking specifically of Boeing, uh, also the various auto companies. Hmm. Okay. When did you okay. want to start? Yeah, so maybe I can start with the first question. And it, you know, it's a good question, and I understand why you're asking it, um, but I do think that um, there's kind of a, an expectation about U.S. leadership and U.S. engagement in Asia, and I think that even though people were following what was going on in our election, I think they, it was hard to kind of cross the bridge and to really 
um, conclude, therefore, that the U.S. on day three, without even kind of going through a process of looking at what it got out of TPP, or trying to figure out was there a way to improve it, um, or was there a way to, um, you know, to tweak it, whatever, that the decision came very abruptly, and, and I think Dan mentioned on the third day of um, President Trump's presidency. So that's how I would answer that question, combined with, you know, once again, what I said earlier was that the U.S. was successful in bringing, you know, the other 11 trading partners to high standard agreements where the U.S., frankly, had to change very few laws or regulations. So it was kind of bringing these other countries to our standards of intellectual property protection, to our standards, you know, our labor standards, our environmental standards, et cetera. Um, with, respect, with respect to the border adjustment tax, um, I would just respond by saying it's more than the uncertainty. And here, there's a lot of concern among our trading partners that the border adjustment tax may be um, um, developed in a way that will discriminate against imports. Um, and therefore, um, you know, there's a lot of concern that it, the way it, it is, is crafted may violate the U.S. Um, WTO obligations. And finally, if there was a question, you know, where are, you know, how are U.S. companies viewing this uncertainty in the trade climate now? Um, it's hard to generalize. I think a lot of these comp companies are watching what's going on. Um, their U.S. companies are very split on this border adjustment tax. You have the, you know, the Boeings and the GEs, the exporters on one side of the border adjustment tax debate, a lot of the retailers and companies that import more on the other side of that debate. Um, and so we'll have to see how that, you know, kind of shakes out. Um, I do think um, the NAFTA renegotiation in particular, because I believe that will kind of be the first negotiation out of the box, um, will, um, if unsuccessful, will cause a lot of concern, particularly among our, our auto companies, because in the auto sector, our companies are so integrated with the Canadian um, Finnish cars and um, auto parts suppliers and with their Mexican auto support auto parts suppliers and finished car companies. Um, I've read somewhere that if we were to withdraw from NAFTA, um, a number, a considerable number of auto plants in the U.S. would need to close within a week because they just wouldn't have the parts they need to build their cars. Can I try to uh, uh, respond to some of the, some of the questions? Um, I think, in, in a way, it's sort of, uh, follows what we just went, Wendy just mentioned. Many of the uh, Japanese companies are holding their breath to see what will be the final outcome of the debate within the United States, either on, be it on trade negotiating uh, modality or on border adjustment tax. Uh, coming back to the earlier question, of why were we in Asia surprised by the TPP decision? Well, during the campaigning, it was, seen as a campaign. It was not a final policy decision as to what to do with TPP. So there was always hope that maybe uh, lame duck or maybe under the Clinton administration, people will change their initial views and uh, put, bring it into effect. So there was always this hope, so long as it was only an internal domestic debate. But now it's a, a government decision. So now we were, in a way, surprised. Uh, um, by this final outcome. Likewise, in the other areas of business, uh, from business point of view, board adjustment, the trade the negotiations, we are still in the holding pattern, and we're waiting to see how your government will decide on the modality of negotiations or the tax package. Yeah, uh, I think the rationale behind the uh, board adjustment tax is uh, 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 inducing more uh, foreign investment in the United States. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, when you compare cost in NAFTA supply chains, so they compare Mexico and certain states uh, of the United States and Canada. And they also consider uh, supply chains there, each different countries. But uh, I think it's a just simple uh, comparison of cost between Mexico and United States, and I, I don't mention this particular company name here, but the, uh, I think they uh, found, they have found uh, uh, 
uh, cost in United States much more expensive, more than five times, six times. Then I think is the Trump administration would like to uh, uh, put you know uh, border adjustment tax or some retaliatory measures, but they have to consider their long-term investment plan. But you know the the way uh, to do that is uh, making more longer than four years or eight years uh, present term uh, of the United States. And that really, really uh, uh, make uh, uncertainty bigger mm. and is not uh, helpful uh, to the United States as well. That's a very good point. Well, I was asked now to invite you all to join our, our hosts uh, on the first floor for a reception. But before leaving, and we can carry on this conversation there, uh, please help me thank uh, Ambassador Kim, Ambassador Cutler, Ambassador Oshima, and thank you for coming. <laughs>